My name is Sarah Biddulph. I'm the director of the Asian Law Centre. I acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose land our meeting this evening is taking place. I acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Today, I'm both pleased and privileged to be able to chair this wonderful panel celebrating Asian Australian lawyers from William Arquette to today to discuss and celebrate the contribution of Asian Australian lawyers to the legal life of Victoria and to the Victorian community more broadly. As you will see from the title of this panel, Asian Australians have played a vital role in the legal profession since the late 1800s, starting with Victoria's first barrister, William Arquette, who was one of the pioneers. I would now like briefly to introduce our panel members in the order in which they will speak. Dr. Andrew Godwin is Associate Professor at Melbourne Law School and serves as the Director of Transnational Law, uh, Director of the Graduate Program in Banking and Finance Law, and is Associate Director of the Asian Law Centre. Before that, he worked as Chief Representative in the Shanghai Representative Office of the international law firm Linklaters. Amongst his many accomplishments and interests is his work on the history of William Arquette. Ms. Tianyi Long is the third recipient of the William Arquette Scholarship and is now working as a legal and governance officer at Glenira City Council. She was previously a policy officer at the University of Melbourne, a member of the Caston Centre for Human Rights and was a young ambassador for UNICEF. Mr. Rana Tang AM is a full member of the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal, where he hears matters across a broad range of jurisdictions from residential tenancies to medical and legal disciplinary matters. Prior to his VCAT appointment, Mr. Tang was a tax lawyer specialising in federal and state tax issues associated with mergers and acquisitions, private equity transactions and major projects. In 2013, he served as the president of the Law Institute of Victoria and was a founder and inaugural president of the Asian Australian Lawyers Association. In 2019, Mr. Tang became a member of the Order of Australia for his service to the law and professional legal associations. Mr. William Lai, OAM QC, was first called to the Victorian Bar in 1988. He took silk in 2018. Amongst his specialist skills, Mr. Lai is an accredited mediator and has been appointed arbitrator on a number of international arbitration panels, including serving on the panel of foreign arbitrators of the Shanghai International Arbitration Centre. In 2017, Mr. Lai became a member of the Order of Australia for service to the law, to business, and to the promotion of cultural diversity. With Raina Tang, Mr. Lai is a founding member of the Asian Australian Lawyers Association and served as that association's national vice president between 2013 and 2018. Welcome to you all. Firstly, I'd like to ask a question of Andrew Godwin. Andrew, you've been working on a history of William Arquette, Victoria's first Chinese Australian barrister with his descendants. Could you tell us something about his story and his contribution to the legal profession? As you noted, William Arquette is generally regarded as the first barrister of Chinese origin to join the independent bar in Victoria. Arquette was born in Wangaratta in 1876 and died in Melbourne in 1936. His parents were both from Guangdong province in southern China. His father, Marquette, came here to work as a community leader and interpreter for the Chinese workers on the gold fields. William also spent time assisting as an interpreter before moving to Melbourne to undertake his legal studies at Melbourne University. After completing his training at the firm of Maddock and Jamison, which is now Maddox, Arquette joined the Victorian Bar. He was a tireless advocate in the fight against racial discrimination. 
including in the area of immigration, and appeared in many cases that we would describe today as public interest cases. Many of these cases were argued before the High Court, and one in particular, Potter and Minahan, decided in 1908, is still regarded as current law. What I find most inspiring about William Arquette and his legacy is his effort in building bridges between the Chinese and the non-Chinese community in Melbourne and beyond. He himself, I think, was the embodiment of diversity and inclusion, both in his work and in his personal life. In addition to being well-versed in Chinese culture and philosophy, William Arquette is said to have possessed a deep knowledge of the Western classics and modern languages. He was a renowned orator. In fact, his friend, Sir Robert Menzies, was understood to have been inspired by his skills in this regard. And he was famous for including quotes from Shakespeare, the Scottish poet, Robert Burns, and Gilbert and Sullivan operas during his appearances in court. As you mentioned, uh, I'm currently researching the life and times of William Arquette and working both with the descendants of the Arquette family and with others for this purpose. And I'd like in particular to acknowledge the efforts of our other panelists, Tian Yi Lung, William Lai and Reynard Tang in helping to inspire me along this journey. Tian Yi, you are the third recipient of the William Arquette Scholarship and have written on the need for diversity intelligence in the Australian legal profession. Would you tell us something about your experiences as a government lawyer and about the concept of diversity intelligence and its role in strengthening the administration of justice for all members of the Victorian community? I'll start with the second question. Diversity intelligence is a relatively new concept um, proposed in the context of human resource management. Uh, it's defined to mean the capability of individuals to recognize the value of diversity and to use this information to guide thinking and behavior. And in that context, diversity means all of the differences that make up an individual's identity. And culture is an important element, but um, also age and gender and sexuality and different abilities and so forth. In, in my essay last year, I argued that diversity intelligence should be valued as a skill that we work hard at and that we pride ourselves on. I think this is true for most professions, but especially important for lawyers. And that's because we have an ethical and a professional duty to uphold the administration of justice. And to me, that means that we actively turn our minds to what justice means for different members of the community. And we make sure that our work isn't affected by our own biases. For that reason, I argued that diversity intelligence should be incorporated into CPD requirements for lawyers. Turning back now to, to my experience in government, I've worked in higher education and I've worked in local government, and I love both. Um, I love that both organizations build and serve a, a really diverse community. And I also love that working in government gives me an opportunity to help affect change. Um, it's taught me that even if the wheels of change may be a little slow, it is possible to affect real and systemic change. And it helps me to wake up every morning knowing that my work moves us all forward. Thank you, Tim. Raina, would you say something about your experiences, the contributions made to the legal profession by Asian Australian lawyers, and some of the challenges facing Asian Australian lawyers today? I think it's important to observe that although we've had Asian Australian lawyers uh, in Victoria from the late 1800s, it wasn't until 2013 uh, when I was elected we had the first person with an Asian heritage as president of the Law Institute of Victoria. That's the first in the LIV's then 154-year history. It's fantastic now that we have the second with Sam Panja, who is of Indian heritage, serving as LIV president, albeit remotely in these strange and unusual times. When William Lai, myself and others got together to establish the Asian Australian Lawyers Association, it was apparent that there was a dearth of Asian Australian lawyers in the senior echelons of the legal profession. So that's looking at partners in law firms, senior counsel at the bar, and in the ranks of the judiciary. The anecdotal ev uh, evidence from my discussions with many leading up to the foundation of the AALA is that the certain prejudice which Sir Robert Menzies observed had limited William Marquette's practice at the bar continued to inhibit 
the advancement of Asian Australians within the legal profession. Research by McKinsey has shown the benefits that diversity or cultural diversity can bring to organisations in terms of different perspectives and improved decision making. However, a report by the Diversity Council of Australia suggests that it's actually some of these differences, particularly in terms of leadership styles, that have held back Asian Australians across all aspects of society in Australia. As a society, I think we need to be more open to difference and different ways of doing things. Indeed, we are all finding out now how it's possible to adapt our work practices for the better. There is some reason to be optimistic uh, with a position improving over the last seven years. In June, when new partners are announced, we regularly see more Asian Australian faces in the photos that appear in the Australian Financial Review. And remarkably, in 2018, we saw both William Lai and Cam Truong appointed as senior counsel in Victoria. And in recent years, we've seen a number of Asian Australians appointed to tribunals and the magistracy in Victoria, as well as to the federal courts. However, I think the recent evidence of racist attacks on Asians during the coronavirus epidemic illustrates the ability of old prejudices to quickly resurface. It highlights the need to continue to press for diversity and inclusion, inspired by the example that William Marquette gave us. Thank you, Ray. William, over your many decades of leadership in the legal profession and as an advocate for greater inclusion, You've been very vocal about issues facing Asian Australians, including the bamboo ceiling. Would you say something about your experiences, the contributions made to the legal profession by Asian Australian lawyers, and some of the challenges facing Australian Asian lawyers today? By way of context, I was born in Malaysia and came to Australia in 1982, commenced a tertiary education at Monash University. Having now lived in Australia longer than I have lived in Malaysia, I can say that I am privileged to call Australia home. I have been blessed with the many privileges of being an Australian. By and large, my experiences have been very positive. I met my wife in Australia. I have two wonderful adult sons. Um, I completed four degrees. My eldest son, of course, thought, he could do better than me by undertaking a PhD. We are certainly enjoying the fruits of our hard work. It sounds like we are a model minority. What more can one ask for? The truth for most migrants is that they are content with what they have achieved in Australia in comparison with their former home country. They might not be like a crazy rich Asian, but they have a house, a car or two, and enough savings to get by. Australia is seen by overseas people as the land of milk and honey. It is a lucky country. Most have more than enough, yet underlying this richness, there is a dark side, in my opinion, to attaining excellence. What we don't see, we don't understand. When I joined the Victorian bar, in May 1988. Little did I know that there were probably less than five barristers of Asian descent in Australia. In Victoria, there was one person who came from Sri Lanka, Nimal Wigrama Nayaki, QC. I was the other Asian. There might have been a small number who had mixed heritage, but they never disclosed that to anyone. It was certainly a difficult road for me as a young barrister who looked and sounded different from other barristers. I could not see any diversity at the upper echelon of the legal profession. As Rainer mentioned, there were no judges in Australia with Asian background or heritage. Today, there are just a handful of judicial officers who have an Asian background. In the early days, it seems like a novelty being a barrister who does not fit nicely into a package. Barristers who did not know me wouldn't have thought that I was one of them. On rare occasions, I would be asked for directions by strangers at Owen Dixon Chambers. 
as if I was a concierge. I also witnessed the same treatment with my other Asian colleagues. Today, there are many more barristers of diverse background at the bar. There is no longer that strange look or stare. I certainly felt welcome and accepted by my colleagues at the Victorian Bar. But it was, and to some extent still is, difficult to break through certain barriers. I worked much harder on my briefs to level the playing field. But even that was not enough, as I would be lost among the larger pool of barristers. It took me 18 years at the bar before a senior silk gave me an opportunity to be involved at the Commercial Bar Association. By that time, I had learned much about leadership in the community or associations that I was involved with, uh, but that was the first time for me to be involved in some leadership capacity uh, at the commercial bar. It gave me a tremendous opportunity to contribute to the bar and to be seen. And I think this was the beginning of the germination of ideas and the promotion of cultural diversity in the law, including the discovery of William Arquette, the first barrister of Chinese descent in Australia, who was a member of the Victorian Bar. In terms of contributions then made to the legal profession by the Asian Australian Lawyers Association that Rena and I and others founded, I think my recollection is that back in 2009 or 10, I had established an Asia practice section under the Commercial Bar Association that sought to represent barristers interested in practice of law in Asia. It was then a unique perspective because there were no other similar associations in other state or territory uh, bars. While the idea for a law group comprising of Asian Australians germinated much earlier, and that was back in 2006, I felt that the time was not quite right to create a broader association representing all lawyers um, that focused on promoting cultural diversity in the law. But in 2013, we were fortunate to have a group of like-minded Asian Australian lawyers who determined to make a difference and establish an association that seeks to promote cultural diversity in the law. We were also fortunate to have Rainer Tang in the leadership seat at the Law Institute of Victoria. Today, there is greater diversity of law. Um, associations such as Hellenic Australian Lawyers Association, the African Australian Legal Network, the Muslim Legal Network, the French Australian Legal Society, uh, the North American Australian Lawyers Alliance, the Korean Australian Lawyers Association, and the Sri Lankan Australian Lawyers Association. Of course, the Asian Australian Lawyers Association was not the first of its kind uh, because the Italian Lawyers Association was formed then. But we have now established branches in New South Wales, Queensland, Western Australia, and have its thriving committee um, in the Australian Capital Territory. One of our significant contribution is the establishment of the William Arquette Scholarship, which is a national uh, essay competition. And I must say our tr proudest moment was to have the honor and privilege of Chief Justice Kiefel of the High Court of Australia give the keynote speech last year and announced the winner of the 2019 William Arquette Essay Competition in the Great Hall of the High Court of Australia. And the winner, of course, is my fellow panelist, Tian Yi Long. And we're very proud of her achievement in that regard. I have to acknowledge and give credit to my wife, Sheree Ong, who back in 2006 proposed to me the idea of establishing the William Arquette Scholarship at the Victorian Bar. Now, it took 11 years for us to bring this wonderful initiative into reality with very much support from Rainer Tang, 
uh, when he was president of the Asian Australian Lawyers Association. That's really inspirational um, and, and so inspirational to hear all of your stories. Now I'd like to ask the panel um, some other questions. I want to know, how has the situation with COVID-19 created more challenges for Asian Australians in their professional and personal lives? Tenny, could I turn to you first, please, for a view? Yeah, um, I think that um, the COVID-19 pandemic has, I guess, accentuated and brought out some, some differences and some challenges that Asian Australians have, have experienced for some time. Prejudice is a new, it, it limited William Arquette's practice in the bar. And today we, we see the same prejudice splashed across newspaper headlines and, and in red paint on garage doors. Um, from a work perspective, Asian Australians who may already be experiencing difficulties in getting their foot in the door might, might be extra affected by, by the economic downturn caused by the pandemic, because that, that means that there are even fewer opportunities. Um, some Asian Australians who, who may be used to social interactions or, or perhaps negotiating at work based on reading the room might find that a bit harder to do over the phone or on Zoom. Um, and, and in that regard, speaking of sort of work and careers and, and the like, I, I wanted to take an opportunity to acknowledge law students and particularly international students. So, so this is, a, I guess, a message for you. You know, if you're, if you're missing home or stressing about finding a job or, or finding it difficult to, to build those friendships or those social connections because of the, the social distancing restrictions, um, I, I wanted to say that I, I can't say I have all the answers, but I hear you, you know, we, we know it's tough. And we, we also know that this period isn't going to define you. So, you know, if you need a chat, you're welcome to get in touch. I'm sure my details can be made available. Thank you. William, do you have some insights you'd like to share about the challenges facing Asian Australians today? I think there are many challenges that Asian Australians uh, face today. And it ranges uh, depending on where you are at in your career development. But I think the greatest challenge, in my opinion, is to overcome apathy. And I see a lot of that uh, in the community in which I'm uh, involved in and, uh, ha and have been over many years. I'm, of course, generalizing to some extent with the comments I'm about to make. And may even be accused of stereotyping Asian Australians. Don't get me wrong, Asian Australians, like all Australians of uh, what, you know, all backgrounds, uh, um, feel that this is a very lucky country and we are blessed. Given what's happened, um, the way how we dealt and cope with uh, COVID-19 and, and flattened the curve, we um, have done so much better than others. But in terms of our own personal development, Asians, like others who have migrated here or indeed uh, come from um, families uh, where their parents uh, are migrants, particularly Asians by their nature and upbringing, they're generally passive to taking up ch well, challenges that they feel that they cannot succeed. The concept of resilience is not necessarily instinctive because there's a whole generation that haven't seen hardship and face uh, issues like what we are facing now. While many might yearn for success, I think this is often measured by Asians, at least uh, speaking from a cultural background and growing up in Asia and understanding how all these things uh, play out. Um, they often measure things uh, in a materialistic way, like how many houses do you own? What type of car do you drive? How many cars do you have? And how much money do you earn? I mean, these are questions that uh, generally you don't get asked so directly and bluntly, but for an Asian, that is what matters to them. So learning to contribute to our community at large, uh, and particularly to the legal profession as our fraternity, I think it's a good starting point to build on leadership skills that we can use and at least uh, be given the opportunity in the future. Those of us who have broken through the ceiling 
I think need to do more because the younger generation of Asian Australians, uh, particularly those uh, in the law, feel that they cannot achieve any kind of breakthrough because they cannot see people like them making it to great heights. And the saying is true, you cannot be what you cannot see. If there are more Asian Australian role models who can act as champions or sponsors, not just men as mentors, but as the champion, uh, the person who would sponsor another, then more will be pulled up to positions of leadership, whether as partners of law firms, general counsel in corporation, senior counsel, or judges in superior court. Thank you, William. Uh, they're very salutary insights. Raina, could I ask you now, please, what are some of the steps we should be taking to combat racism and to ensure our Asian Australian community feels respected and included? Well, I think it seems clear that the fears that people have about the coronavirus, both in terms of their health and the impact on their jobs, are leading them to look for someone to blame. And in the most extreme cases, we're seeing that people lash out at those of Chinese or even broader Asian origin. And unfortunately, no one is immune to that. Recently, a friend of Vietnamese background who I went to law school with was shocked when she experienced racial abuse going into the Melbourne CBD with her children. So I think uh, both the media and politicians have a role to play in combating those fears. In terms of the media, there's no doubt that words have an impact and that those in the media have a responsibility to exercise that power uh, in, in a proper way. Every reference that's made to the China virus or the like has the potential to fan the flames of existing prejudice, as does any other language that conflates China with people that may have a Chinese background. In terms of politicians, there is the need to call out and dismiss racist sex and commentary. And care needs to be applied in debates around immigration levels, which so easily morph into nationalistic tropes. And I think politicians also need to avoid using language such as calling for international students and migrant workers to go back home, which reinforces an othering of such people when the reality is we're all facing the current situation together. More broadly, others in the community need to stand up and not let such incidents pass unremarked. As the saying goes, the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. Yes, thank you, Raina. Andrew, could I ask you to add a comment? Yes, first of all, I'd like to reiterate a key point that I think has come out of our discussion, namely the tremendous contribution that diversity and inclusion have made and continue to make to the fabric of Australian society. Both Tian Yi and Raina mentioned that prejudice had limited William Arquette's practice at the bar. This might explain why he was never appointed to the ranks of senior counsel or elevated to the bench. Interestingly, Arquette never made an issue out of prejudice, except when he was fighting for the rights of others. He always focused on what we all have in common and what brings us all together. During the course of delivering the second Morrison lecture in 1936, which was three years before his untimely death, William Arquette queried whether there were any actual differences between the culture of the East and the culture of the West. In a comment that was reported in the newspapers at the time, Arquette mused that if Confucius had lived today, it's likely that he would have found in the music of the bagpipes something particularly stirring and satisfying to the soul. Now, the bagpipes would have had special meaning for Arquette as his wife, Gertrude, was of Scottish descent. As I mentioned at the start, William Arquette really was the embodiment of diversity and inclusion. Thanks to each of you for participating in this panel and for sharing your insights and experiences with us. Your stories and your commitment to promoting diversity, equality and respect in our community over so many years is truly inspirational. Thank you.